My name is Chris Curran from The Mystic Show, and I'm here with Mike Waskoski from AscensionWorks.tv. Hello. And we're just going to have a nice, simple chat. Uh, this is going to be an episode of The Mystic Show, and it's also going to be up on AscensionWorks.tv. So The Mystic Show is a show where I talk about spirituality and meditation and a, a lot of deeper esoteric subjects, but they're also very practical in many ways. I mean, everything I really talk about is based on practical experience and, and, and using, you know, gaining knowledge and experience to use it in our, li- in our own lives to create a better life for ourselves and our families and stuff. And AscensionWorks.tv, Mike, why don't you give us a quick overview of that? Yeah, I'm trying to work with a lot of people like yourself to put up more content that would be related to what people have called the ascension of consciousness of humanity. But really, what you're talking about is really the core of it, is what, what actually matters, what's valuable. And I think as people lessen their attachment to seeing value in what the world has been pumping as the valuable way of living, the way of thinking, and we find more of our value in spirituality and the inner work, and we take back our power to kind of transform our lives from the inside out, basically. I think that that's that's the core of what what the spiritual spiritual progress path is that we're on, spiritual transformation process, and also it's the core of what is the most practical thing that we can we can possibly do to 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 make our lives better and to achieve whatever it is that we're seeking. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I've found in my experience that people come to spirituality or they come to these topics because they've reached sometimes reached a low point in their life and that happened to me that's my story i've told it many times but I'm, i won't tell it here but my story was i basically hit rock bottom and then it kind of woke me up and i said man there's got to there's got to be more to life than this and so so if you're here watching it watching this and you're in that phase of your life it's a great place to be because now you're in exploring mode right you're sort of and and not exploring outside inside Right. Yeah. So we have a bunch of topics lined up. First couple things I want to mention is that I have a, cup, a Spotify playlist that uh, I heard a while back, and it's really awesome for relaxation or meditation or ceremonies. Like there's, it, There are many tracks on it. It's very long. It's like six or seven hours, but it's really cool. It's called Syllodep Session 2. It's on Spotify. I will, we will put that in the show notes. And the other thing... On my other YouTube channel, I have uh, a playlist called Background Music While Working. And because I work from home on my computer, and I, it just, when I'm just doing menial things, uh, it, it really helps to put on, you know, there's some classical music on there, it, it, and, you know, some electronic music, but it's very chill. I just sort of gathered these tracks that were kind of cool to have on in the background if you're just, you know, bopping along, doing some work. So we'll, I'll put that in the show notes as well. I wanted to talk about meditation first because meditation is so wonderful, but not everyone knows that. Yeah. And recently I visited my mother over the holidays, and my mother has never been into meditation ever. She, she knows that I've been into it for a long time. But this was the first time me and my wife visited my mom and we we said, oh, we're gonna let, let's do a meditation. We, we didn't really ask her. We just kind of said, eh, let's meditate for about fifteen minutes. And I have a little song that I play, same in the in the meetups that we have. And my mom was like, okay. And then we sat down, and I you know I told my mom what to do and how to do it and how to relax and all that. And and then we we meditated for probably fifteen minutes and. You know, I don't know if she was opening her eyes or I, I don't I don't know the experience and I don't it doesn't even matter. But I was just so happy to meditate with my mom. It just really felt good. Have have you have any experience like that? Yeah, I mean I've I try to get my mom to meditate more too. And and I think she doesn't think that she can do it well. Um but I mean, I mean there, I, there there were two different stages to this process, I guess, also. There was the stage of I don't know how I feel about this because there's there's this Western programming amongst fundamentalist Christians that that you you can't invite anything that resembles the Eastern religion into your life, and me, although meditation is clearly des- described in the Bible, it's just that it says to meditate on the scriptures, 
you know, but but the the concept is, um, you know, basically like you, you you want to actually take a, take a moment to to give yourself a break to 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 think on higher thoughts or allow your mind to distance itself from the the thoughts that you've been plagued by for um, most of your day. If your if your day is full of anxieties, it's definitely wise to at least step away from that a little bit. And however however you can do that, so yeah, I feel like. Uh, it's something I probably should work on more with with my family in general because it seems like you know the problems that we think we have to resolve through discussion probably can be resolved faster just through stopping discussion and just letting ourselves just just be and and just allow the peace of the of the present moment to come into our experience more. Definitely, and I agree with that. But this is what I've experienced with my family. They like even my mom and every other member of my family. They've never been open to spirituality. They've never been open to meditation. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're they're happy that I'm doing it. They don't have a problem with me doing it, but they're not ready to do it. And I think a lot of families are like that. And so, like you just said, you 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 hope you can suggest it. You hope you can go that direction. But I think the fact is that a lot of family members, they're just not ready to do it. And you can't try to push them into it either, right? Yeah. It's a very weird thing. That's why I was so amazed that my, that my mom just did it with us. Now, she's older and she, you know, I started meditation 20 years ago. So she's had 20 years of hear, at least hearing that word. Mm-hmm. So I think by now she's just more open to it and she was just happy to be with her son and daughter-in-law. So, yeah. That's great. But it's hard to get, you know, it's hard to get people to meditate. And by the way, these are the notes for the show. I'm not checking my Twitter or anything like that. So just so you know. Um, oh, because in 2003 when I started meditation and I, to- I first told my mom about meditation, maybe not the first time, maybe like within the first month or two of me talking about meditation, she literally asked me, so wait, are you a Hindu now? <laughs> she literally asked me that. And I was like, oh. Like, but you know, it, again, it's it's mom, it's fine, but uh, but that just shows you the mindset, yeah. right? And it's it really meditation is really like calming. This is one way to view meditation: calming the channel, which enables reception from the ultimate or above. It's like, I mean, because you, I'm sure you've experienced it a lot. When you meditate, yes, you might have all kinds of thoughts and stuff. But at times, and maybe not every day, but at times you really have new thoughts like, oh, like even for your business, like, oh, I should look into that product or I should maybe develop this service. Like you, you actually, there, there are creative ideas that come up. Have you experienced that? Right, yeah, people call that downloads very often. Mm-hmm. But I think you could also interpret it as your higher guides giving you assistance or your higher self, you know, or the Holy Spirit, however you look at it. But I think that there is like a lower self and a higher self integration process that is that is allowing us to um, receive from the intuition on a deeper level than we normally would if we're distracted. Yeah, because living everyday life, there's a lot of times when you feel stuck, you don't know what to do next, and you, you want answers, but you don't know where to get the answers. And I've often felt in business, because I'm basically a solopreneur, I always want to hire like a business coach or something, or get one of my friends to pretend they're a business coach. So... But, but a lot, I think a lot of times we're overlooking this creative thing that happens after we meditate and right. the answers can come and they do. Yeah. Even people who don't meditate, they'll, get, they'll be driving down the road, they'll get an idea, oh, I should start a business doing this, right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's also something people associate with prayer that you know, you're, you're praying for guidance, but you have to give the time not just to send the prayer, but to receive the response to the prayer. So. A lot of times if I feel like I'm stuck in, in, in something and I don't understand what I should be doing or it's overwhelming, I have too many choices to make, if I just give myself that time to, to, to just sit in, in peace and silence um, and, and, and just let those challenging energies be, be what they are and, and gradually just feel them, and then it feels like it's like puzzle pieces just untwisting and then falling back in place as I allow myself to just kind of hear the right answer. What, what is the most perfect answer because I think what the the intention that we have for our business, the intention that we have for doing any kind of projects 
uh, that core motivation is what, kind of what we're wanting to get back in touch with, too. Instead of being distracted by the details, we get back in, in touch with, you know, what, what, what the deeper level of this intention is. And then once we can tap into that, 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 that will that we have, then the, the natural next step for, for us, I think, becomes more apparent also, also by our own process of being open to that. Right, and you just reminded me of when I was sort of like a coach 10, 12, 15 years ago. Uh, I learned from Bob Proctor and others, and he th there was a program called Purpose, Vision, and Goals. And the purpose is like the overarching purpose. The vision is like, well, what does that look like? And then the goals are like day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week specific goals. And, if, and, and so if you get caught up in the goals, yeah you get caught up in the weeds, sometimes we forget what our actual purpose is, right? So I always found it great to just re to zoom out and re like reflect on that. All right, what is, my, what is my vision here? How would I like it to unfold or go? And then, and then you can even zoom out more, what is my purpose? And these are hard questions though, right? Yeah. And I think there's a, bigger, there's a bigger aspect to that is that if our purpose is in alignment with some higher dimension of, of reality where there's some kind of coordinated effort between, you could call them like angelic beings or, um, you know, if, if we all have some kind of mission on earth that we might not even know consciously, I think if, if our limited consciousness becomes more in alignment with that broader vision or, or mission to help humanity in some way, then also our, you know, our purpose can come, come back into alignment with a higher purpose and it's like we have more more help and more assistance and more miracles, I think, come into our lives and we're more and more aligning with the truest, highest purpose for ourselves. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, re I recently had an example of what some people might call flow. You know, when you're just, you're, you're thinking things, you're doing things, and, but it, it's sort of just like happening. And it happened to me with a new technology and then a conference that I want to attend. And it's, it's like everything just happened. I couldn't have written a better script where I find these videos, I watch the videos, and then I learn this, and then I find out about this event that's happening, and then I go, and there's, you know, then I register, then I register for the event, and I book my flight, and everything, it just all happened. I mean, literally, this happened within a matter of hours. Yeah. There's a great quote in The Raw Contact that says to um, pay attention to the seemingly strange and random occurrences that seem to unfold in your life that, that, that just seem to occur randomly by coincidence, but actually every, everything is happening for a, a purpose and that we're, we're given everything that we need, it says in the passage. Every, you know, every entity will receive the opportunity that each entity needs, is the quote. So it, it, it seems like the universe is unfolding on some kind of magical dimension that we can't even always see with the random, random coincidences, but it's never really random. And you know the funny thing, when I was about to book the flight and book the hotel, like my, my what would you call it, my conscious, my, my lower mind, my conscious mind, whatever, it, all, it started to doubt. It was like, really, man? You just found out about this 40 minutes ago and you're, you're booking your flight already? <laughs> but I don't know, maybe it's because I'm a little older and I'm, it, this has happened a few times. Like, and, and, and also, I'm, I'm a little more courageous than most people, I think. I mean, who knows, but... I was just like, no, no, I'm doing it. And it, it, and it felt good. Yeah. I had, I had that experience when I found out about Stephen Greer's uh, trainings that he, he was doing um, in the deserts of near Palm Springs, California. As soon as I found out that this event was happening, I realized the registration was about to close. So I, so I sent in and I got like right in before the deadline. And that ended up just, you know, being extremely, one of the most important things of my life to attend Stephen Greer's a week-long training program that led me to recognize that there's there's a lot more going on. This is <laughs> I don't know if we're going in too much of the deep end here, but but Stephen Greer leads, and now he's becoming more mainstream too. He's got documentaries on Netflix and Amazon Prime, and there's a movie called Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. You can see me in there with my group, my meditation group, and that's <laughs> it's an interesting excuse to get people together to meditate to say we're going to watch the sky and see if anything shows up after our meditation, and very often it does. Yeah. Like flashes of lights in the sky and seemingly signaling us when we're, when we, when we're in a loving state as a, as a group and we're watching the sky. Very often the, the loving exchanges seem cor correlated to the, the flashes and the, and the bright lights in the sky that seem to not be explainable in any other way than 
some other higher intelligence. Yeah, and I've been on those some of those experiences with you, and it's it it's really very very um, I want to say very interesting, but I also want to say it it's it's like opening your consciousness, you know, like. To me, it's all about the consciousness. That's why if you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, there's lights in the sky, whatever, these people are weird. <laughs> it's not, like, always remember, we as human beings right now, we know literally zero about consciousness. Literally, I mean, maybe 0.0001%. So if you think, so we don't understand so much around us. Science pretends to know everything and science knows n almost nothing. So when we do events like that, what you we're doing is we're, say we're, we're sort of admitting the fact and, and we're accepting the fact that we don't really know what's going on here. And what one of the <laughs> smartest and most fun people to listen to I find is Eric Weinstein. And he was just on Joe Rogan. I don't know if you saw that. And he was talking about, he actually did this too. He went out in the desert uh -huh. to try to make contact. I, I'm pretty sure that's what he mentioned in this podcast with Joe Rogan, and and he's he's trying to approach everything from like a theoretical physics perspective because if if, if the fact that we're being visited um, because of the fact that Einstein's equations aren't valid, the fact that we can go tr faster than the speed of light, or if there's some some larger aspect to these theoretical equations that allows us to play with the nature of reality um, with with technology, and if there are beings doing this, then it seems like we're probably being um, you know, very heavily watched and monitored, and, and um, it's almost like they're deliberately trying to remain hidden if they are as hidden as they are. And the number of puzzles people <laughs> to pursue in the UFO area is so vast that it's fun to watch people wake up and actually, you know, try to pursue these puzzles because it's 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 just a labyrinth of you know conspiracies and rumors and speculations <laughs> um, that just never ending. Um, but it, but it is kind of like. You know, the raw context says that it's the sense of mystery is why they, the positive entities are are appearing in our reality to inspire us to break down some of the walls that we have that we assume so much about what we we think we know about the nature of reality, and if we can open up to the sense of mystery or the mystical, and <laughs> the mystics show very appropriate, we, we're we're really trying to find the the sense of the mystical more in our lives that allows us to break down the walls that we set up artificially, very artificially, I think. Wow, great points, well said. So, I wanted to talk about an analogy. Oh, do you have anything more to add? Oh, I could talk on that subject for hours. I was gonna say, <laughs> like, look, this is, anyway, hopefully we can do a lot more of these. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful. Um, so, okay. What, we're ju what we were just talking about is consciousness and sort of, you know, admitting the fact that we don't really know a lot of what's going on, but we're, you know, we, we, we're sort of intrigued by the mystical and we're, we're if, if you're open to learning, a lot of learning will happen, right? And so one of the things about human beings is when we're children, our parents have to teach us a lot of very practical things, you know, how to, how to hold the fork, how to pull up your pants, and, you know, all practical things. And some people, and, and, and those are practical things, and, uh, and then there's a lot of superficial things in life as well, like, you know, gossip and what people think of you, and, you know, there's a million superficial things in life. But I think a lot of people... Uh, and this this is all about growth and evolution of the individual. But a lot but a lot of people find it hard to sort of transcend that superficial level, because their mind is always going and like, oh, how could I believe that there are potentially alien beings around? That's ridiculous, and everyone's going to think I'm crazy. And mm -hmm. that's their intellect, their small mind, keeping them down, right? Or or keeping them in the box that they're in, whatever. So. You know, and there are more profound aspects of life that a lot of spiritual uh, people have figured out in their teaching, and a lot of pe a lot of people do experience things like that. And so you have the superficial aspects of life, and then you have the deeper mystical aspects of life. Not everyone gets into the deeper mystical stuff, and it. Th so that situation reminded me of another situation. There's a band named Tool, which I they're my basically my favorite band, Tool. 
and they're very, uh, they play in odd time signatures. It, it, it's not your basic music that you can follow easily. Sometimes they'll be playing and you, you can't catch the beat. It's such a weird off beat. You can't catch it. And the, so the first time you hear it, you're like, what is this? I don't know what this is. Like, and you might not like it because you don't understand it. But here's what happens with Tool. If you listen to, if you keep listening and listen to that song again and tomorrow listen again, eventually you catch the rhythm and it's such an odd but beautiful rhythm. All of a sudden you, your mind opens up and you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And so I think that's analogous to what happens in our lives. We can be in the superficial plane for a while, but some one day you open up to this mystery and it's like, it, that's it. You can't go back, right? The right. paradigm's changed. Yeah. Alexander Scriabin was like that too. I think he actually had a chord named after some of his music called the Mystic Chord. <laughs> and and it, it's the most bizarre, some of his music sounds very bizarre, especially for his time it was very bizarre. But but it, it, it does feel like a, a mystical experience. And there's some funny stories about him. He thought that he was going to like live to see the end of the world and have some like multi-day musical performance like in the, in Tibet or something like that. He had this grand vision and he died young, but but it's like the music sort of brought him to this level where he felt like he was living in a different reality basically. Mm. Um but but yeah, music is is certainly an entry point I think for people to recognize there is maybe another layer to their consciousness that they that they had neglected. Right? And movies are that way too. And yeah, movies have some of the best music too. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so I, this is what I, one thing I wrote. When a person is more superficial and fearful, they are more closed, more judgmental, and more dismissive. When a person is more mature or more zoomed out and less fearful, they see more depth and nuance in people, in situations, and therefore they're less judgmental, they're less harsh right? Yeah. I mean, I threw the word mature in there and I don't know if it fits, but I think we all can understand this idea of maturity that there are some people in life who are just, they stay very immature and there are other people who, who mature and take responsibility and all that. And I think, you know, in practical terms, you call it maturity. In spiritual terms, I don't know what you call that. I mean, it, and we don't have to call it anything. I'm just, I'm just, Bringing that up. Yeah, I feel like there's a certain um, sort of cleanliness to our experience that comes in place once you're no longer stuck in the same habits of unforgiveness or frustration when when you recognize things and they no longer are seen as valueless, they're seen as valuable as teaching tools and you can have gratitude where once there was pain, you know, or frustration. Right, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, so the next topic, topic I wrote down was tension, fear, and anxiety. And this was, another, uh, this was another analogy. So a lot of us feel fear. I think fear is, I mean, it's pretty much universal, right? We, we were just talking about it before we even started recording. Yeah. You know, th th there's always a little fear about this and that. And, it, it, you know, hopefully we can minimize the fear because, you know, we're, we're really, we're, we're sleeping peacefully in the palm of our creator's hand, right? We're being taken care of at the larger levels. We really don't have anything to worry about. But in our small minds and our small life, we have some fears. And so, I don't know, I think the more, what would you say? The more you practice spirituality, the more you open up, the less fearful you are, would you say that? It's mysterious. I, I don't always know if, there are just new fears. You know, I feel like there's aspects of people who are different, people are afraid of different things and have different patterns. You know, I think extroverted people may be less fearful of interacting with people and, you know, social anxiety doesn't necessarily indicate that you're less spiritually mature, I feel. It's just that there's, there's different layers to the um, personality game that we're in with when it comes to um, the, the catalyst that we're being and the catalyst that we're given. Um, but fe fear is very mysterious because it almost feels like fear is the same thing as just believing distortions, believing in lies about, you know, the peace and the perfection of the present moment. 
Um, but yeah, I think there is a path out of fear that's a spiritual path all the time. Right. Yeah, because animals feel fear on, on a, just a, like a basic level, right? Yeah. I, I, do you think that's where our fear comes from? I mean, obviously we're part animal, so I think we have. Yeah, I think it comes from the red chakra. It's basically like the all life has in common this 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 desire for survival, and when the desire for survival becomes connected to different aspects of our of our reality that we are connecting to, or you know, not being able to potentially be secure or have enough food, um, even if it's like it's a very long winding mental pathway to get from the thing we're afraid of all the way back to a concept of survival, it, it's, it's this extension of survival that I think is, is, is related to fear. Uh, and ego, of course, is yeah. what that is. Yeah, ego seems like an extension of the, of the protection of the self, the body. Yeah. So I, I've had an analogy that may apply here. <laughs> um, I, this is one of my favorite analogies of all time, and uh, maybe you can tell me what you think. Um, and it goes along with anxiety and fear. So I, um, I follow chess. I, sometimes I play chess, but I follow like the professional chess players and the professional chess tournaments. And I just love watching chess and analyzing chess and all this. It's, it, it's unbelievable. And I think, by the way, if any kid, if you can teach kids chess, that's one of the best things you can teach a, ch a kid ever because there's so much to it that... Is, is real, you know, preparing, uh, managing your risk, understanding what the opponent might want to do and not just thinking about what you want to do. Like, there's so many amazing things you can learn from studying chess and just having fun with it. Um, but one thing I've recognized, and this is recognized by everyone, is that when I, for instance, when I play chess, I'm not that good. So when I'm you know, I move some pieces and then there comes a time when there's a lot of tension on the board. Like a lot of captures can happen and, and, and because I'm not that good at chess, like I, I could feel myself getting anxious and there's all this tension and <laughs> what do I want to do? I want to relieve the tension and this is what amateur chess players do. It, like if I can take your piece, I'm just going to take it and I'll take your piece. Like I'll just, I just want to relieve all the tension. You know what professional chess players do? When they're in those positions, they don't mind the tension. They can withstand the tension. In fact, sometimes they add to the tension. Bec and, and look, it's obviously because they have way more experience, way better skills in thinking and strategy and tactics. It, you know, obviously. But this is my point, is that the, the, the chess, the grandmasters, they don't get fearful and anxious. I mean, they do a little because mm -hmm. it's just human, but they have it under control. And I, to me, that's like an analogy for life. Like if you're a spiritual master who you've been enlightened and you've, you know, you've lived life, you've experienced all kinds of stuff, like at that point, a little bit of tension, it doesn't matter. And so what do you think about that analogy? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's great. I think, I mean, in some sense, I feel like that's what God is doing with the, all the tensions on earth is it's an exploration of how how silly can we make this game where everyone is at each other's throats and it's really just another side of God experiencing itself, you know, another, another dimension to, to the perfection of a, ch a choice, a free will choice that we're always making to, to, to create the reality that we have. Um, but <laughs> it's funny how some personality types are more prone to want to stir things up and, and throw eggs and get on ca on camera for for shaking up some situation. Um, yeah, I have a friend who <laughs> he just he he enjoyed protesting a little too much and mm. <laughs> enjoyed getting on camera. <laughs> but but I mean, if it can if it can, the idea is that if it can create attention around a problem that needs more attention then the, the tension is justified to highlight the issue. If we don't, if we don't, if we don't highlight what, what the, the situation is and we just try to sweep it under the rug, then the, the mild tension can never get resolved until the, the tension is, is made to a level where we actually want to deal with it in some way and actually face it and, and tackle it properly. Right. I also just thought of this idea of someone, let's say you're, someone's going on an interview and you might feel nervous going into an interview, but if you've been on a lot of interviews, 
you don't get as nervous. And, and if you're not desperate, that also helps. So I think in life, and, and again, I'm talking about myself too. I think some of us, we're, I mean, look, we need money to live. We need clothing and food. We like, you know, I'm, that, that's obvious and clear. And, and some of us are fearful that we're not gonna have those things. And that's a valid, in, in a way, it's a valid fear if you wanna call it that. But I, I just think that, um, it, I don't know, this concept, this concept of uh, rising above fear or something, I don't, you know? Like going into the interview and just not being nervous because okay, I might not get I might get it or I might not get it, and if I don't get it, it's not the end of the world. Like I'm gonna go to on other interviews. Yeah, you have to face the fear completely, and imagining the worst case scenario actually can be the path to getting through your fear. If you're afraid to imagine the worst case scenario, which could be <laughs> a meteor coming and striking everyone dead at the, at right. the instant you, you, you go to the thing that was making you afraid. Right. I don't know, whatever the worst case scenario is, if you can at least go there in your mind and imagine how it, it doesn't matter, and even if you die, it doesn't matter, whatever it is, then if you can get to that point, then you can kind of let all the other fear go. Right. Yeah, some fear is definitely natural. Yeah. And one note I had about fear and anxiety, it's not about intelligence, it's about paradigm. So in the analogy of the chess players, you might think that they can handle the tension and fear better because they're more intelligent. It's not intelligence, it's paradigm. They already know, they, they have in their mind this idea that they're a world-class chess player and they can handle anything. That's their paradigm. For me playing chess, I know I'm not a good chess player and I know I'm going to make mistakes and I just lose and sometimes I don't even know why I lost. It's, you know, so it's it's not about intelligence, it's about paradigm and paradigm is just the way you see the world. It's like, you know, if, if you see yourself as a physical being and that's it, then you have a very small paradigm. But if you see yourself as a spiritual being on this grand mystical journey, I mean, then, you know, a couple bad things can happen in your life. Does it really matter that much? I mean, it might hurt, but it's not the end of you. It's not the end of your mystical experience, right? Yeah. I remember playing chess as a kid and feeling like it was my job to win. And if I didn't win, I was a failure and I'm doing something wrong by losing. But that's what makes all competition, all competitive games people people play as children very useful is because you're you're forced to recognize that this isn't about you. It's about a group of people having having an experience together that is not necessarily rooted in the thing that <laughs> we're told to do, which is to win, but it's it's a, it's a contradiction in that sense. And so I, <laughs> I've played games where I just want to tie the other person and and to, to to tie and 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 you know games like tennis are fun like that where you can just go on and on and on when you're when the other person hasn't uh, you know not ahead by two points. You can just keep on playing on and on and on. <laughs> and it's kind of it's kind of more fun that way when when you can ap- appreciate that the the victory doesn't matter. It's the game. It's you know the song that matters, not the ending of the song. You know, right? Yeah, that's deep. So I'm going to look at the next topic. Why don't you? Ex- Sorry, well, I guess I was going to say. So that means it's like a it's like a paradigm shift, and it's, I think it's that way as a paradigm shift for a lot of people when they when they feel like something matters so much, and then they let go of what they thought mattered most. That's the paradigm re- restructuring, I think. Yeah, that's deep. What's what's an example of that? I wonder. Well, like I said, with 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 playing chess, feeling like I had to win. The paradigm restructuring is realizing that everything is the same, even if I don't win. My life is not hurt because I didn't win. It's just it's just another aspect of my my life. I don't have to put so much attachment in it. So being free of attachments is the paradigm shift. Got it. That makes total sense. So while I'm looking at the next topic, Mike, why don't you tell me and everyone, if I go to ascensionworks.tv, what am I going to find there? Well, <laughs> I'm hoping to add a lot more content, um, but I have right now I have a few courses on there. I want to um, put out the invitation to people who have course content that could be related to higher consciousness, um, health subjects. Uh, if, if you'd like to get out your content, you can use the contact form on there to apply 
to get your content on our platform. Um, but we also have video series and we have a social network. I'm trying to integrate a social network because I'm a programmer. I've been a programmer since my entire adult life. I've been a programmer. So I found a way to integrate a social network with a video platform where um, you can post videos, you can um, share that on the social community, and there's groups, there's forums, um, and we, we're building up a directory of services. If you have a service you want to promote on there, we can add you onto the directory. Um, so it's, it's kind of a way to have a community around higher consciousness-related content, things that we think are most beneficial to helping people. And, and you'll see a lot of videos with me and Corey Good also. I partnered with the most controversial secret space program whistleblower named Corey Good, and I felt like I, that's another way of shaking things up a little bit. I had to do it. He's, he, I believe him from many, many experiences. He's got the most wild stories, though. Um, but I've had so many discussions with him, it's like there's no question in my mind that he's telling the truth. But a lot of people, other, a lot of people out there question question him, and that's totally fine. Right. I, I want to be accepting of everybody's beliefs. I've not, I'm not. But at the same time, I feel like um, his perspective has been very helpful for me in clarifying some of the the bigger picture of what's been going on. Um, you know, he talks about things like wars in the heavens. You could say, um, I feel like they're the Earth is essentially like a proxy war situation. But that's what this transformation that we're going through is all about, is that we have to have this duality intensified on Earth um, until humanity sort of collectively wakes up to the fact that we have to choose to work in harmony and unison. Beautiful. Yeah, so go to ascensionworks.tv, sign up. You can just get a free account and look around. And by the way, with Corey and the fact that you believe him and other people might not believe him, that's kind of like the chess game, winning or losing. Does it really matter? Yeah. Right? It, because we're all on our own journey. It, does it really, that's my question, does it really matter? That's why I, it, it may sound silly, but I don't really care yeah. if, he, if it's the truth or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean in, in a way I do, but you understand, in a way I don't, because. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny that he started out on his journey telling everyone that he was told very specifically by these, these higher density consciousness extraterrestrial beings, it does not matter if people believe you. It matters that these ideas get into the consciousness of humanity so that people can decide for themselves and people can work through their own, their own junk. I mean, it's really about the inner work. It's not about what's going on in space. Yeah. And it's the same thing with religion. You can believe that Jesus was real and whatever you believe about Jesus, or you might believe Jesus was not real. Does it really matter? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so we have three more topics, but we're just going to do one more because we're going to have to do this again because... Mm -hmm. These other two topics were big. In fact, <laughs> I can tease them right now. Which character traits weaken you and which character traits empower you? That's a big discussion. We're going to go over that. And also, having real faith. And, and, not, and, and by the way, real faith is not religious faith. It's, it's different. And there's acceptance in there too. So that's a deep topic. But what... Let's 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 talk about one more topic, and that is anger. Let's talk about anger. I have a quote here from Mahatma Gandhi. I'm going to read, but anger is one of those things. Uh, well, first of all, I want to know from you because you've studied uh, the law of one quite a bit. What does Ra say about anger? They say that anger is a random and undirected energy that just hasn't been properly channeled yet. And the goal of this random metaphysical energy that is sort of like flustering us, the goal is to have it transform the way that we think to go, to channel that energy either into acceptance or control. These are the two paths, these are the two dualities. You can channel your anger in a way that allows you to become more accepting and loving and open-hearted in order to break through that wall of frustration, or you can channel the anger in, into controlling the situation. And, you know, I've, some people will go out and, you know, beat a baseball bat on a tree to try to get their anger out. And I feel like that is a path of control, but at least you're getting the anger out in some form. Um, because the anger, when it's not dealt with in some way, that's when it becomes like a festering issue that, that continues to manifest in our lives in ways that are 
more destructive than properly, you know, focusing on the anger and and intensifying it so that you can do something with it. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting. I did not know that the the control and acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. And and so also I think I would just like to say that anger is is a normal thing. Like, I mean, I I've gotten angry in my life many times and 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 maybe and it's probably a character flaw of mine. Maybe I've gotten angry too much, right? I don't know. Maybe it's because you know, I'm an Aries and like three out of my four first planets are all in Aries and I'm Aries, I'm fire, I'm like I don't know, maybe that's it, maybe not. Does it matter? <laughs> but you know, we can look at people who are angry and we can think that's a character flaw and maybe it is. But my point is that anger is a is a normal is a natural thing and sometimes it's really warranted. Sometimes someone people are going to do something right in front of you and you're going to get angry and you should get angry. Do do you believe that that pe- sometimes people should get angry? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the <laughs> if we're just if we're just um, apathetic to everything, we're not really transforming ourselves or the world around us. We're not helping at all. Yeah. So the Gandhi quote is, I have learned through bitter experience the one supreme lesson to conserve my anger. And as heat conserved is transmuted into energy, even so our anger controlled can be transmuted into a power which can move the world. Right. So it's a power. Yeah. And it's just, what are you going to do with that power? Well, accept or control or even direct, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it can it can wake you up. <laughs> wake you up from any kind of sleep, I guess. Mm. Yeah. One thing I the acceptance part is for me, I know that's what I am learning cuz I'm also getting better at noticing when I'm like when the anger comes on, mm-hmm. like it used to be when I was younger, especially I, there was no, it just happened. Whatever happened just happened. I didn't really, I wasn't conscious of what was happening, but now it, I'm more conscious of it. Yeah. And being more conscious of it, that's the first step, right? In making any change. Like, are you an alcoholic? Well, if you're not even conscious of it, then you're, you're, there's no way you're going to, get better. The first step is be, becoming conscious of it and realizing, oh yeah, there's a, there might be a problem here. <laughs> they actually do suggest in the raw context that, that um, anger that you don't deal with, it's one of the main causes of cancer, is that people are not processing something that's being given to them on a mental level to process. They're not wanting to look at it. They're sweeping it under the rug. And then the body ends up manifesting that. And the body ends up being a mirror for the mind. And the uncleanliness of the mind that we're not, we're not dealing with becomes the uncleanliness of the body. And disease, I think a lot of sicknesses and diseases work this way, where the body is just showing us something that we have to learn that we're, they haven't figured out how to process quite properly yet. So this is why meditation is so important. And I actually know in my own life, I know a person who went through a situation in which they should have been very angry, but they never showed it ever. And, and then they went downhill very quickly with cancer. And, and a year, one year, they were gone. Mm. And, 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 and even in my own mind, I was like, why wouldn't, like, I was saying, why wouldn't you voice your anger? Or, you know what I mean? Like, like but, you know, people handle things differently. But that was just an observation I had. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. It's a touchy subject, but yeah. Yeah, metaphysics is so profound to, to dig into it. And yeah, as soon as you can see the metaphysical cause for issues in your life, you can, you can root them out one by one much faster, I think. Mm. Yeah, it's one thing I can also see with my wife. Sometimes when I get angry, she just doesn't respond at all. Usually, actually pretty much all the time, she doesn't literally doesn't respond at all. <laughs> because I think she knows that it's just like, it's just energy coming off. It's just me hitting a baseball bat against the tree. And she's just standing there like, okay, go ahead. Get, you know, hit the bat against, you know what I mean? She, yeah. Like she's, I think she's next level with, with the anger than I am. <laughs> yeah, my, my wife is kind of that way too with, with me when she knows I'm in a, a 
particular state, she just just lets me be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She has the intuitive wisdom that I don't sometimes. I guess that's the way of looking at it. Which is beautiful, the relationship, because it, it all goes both ways, right? Right, yeah. Which is, that's the beauty of a, of a marriage and a, yeah. Yeah, and a home, yeah, and children. So I do want to mention before we go, uh, me and my wife do meditate. We live stream our meditations twice a week on Thursday evenings and Sunday mornings. You can get more information in the show notes. And, um, and Mike, you are doing monthly live streams. Tell us about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to do a variety of, of live streams with different people, and you can find those at ascensionworks.tv slash schedule, and you can join the live streams that way. Um, and, yeah, I, I hope to have all, all kinds of content covered um, in time, and and send in your questions if you want any particular things dealt with. It'd be great to know. I was just going to say that. Please, if you, have, if you have aspects of things we talked about that you want us to expand upon or even topics or even books, anything, um, you know, I know you and I are, we're, we're like eternal students, right? We're, yeah. and, and we're just, you know, I could tell you in my own life, I've come a long way, but it doesn't mean I've gotten anywhere far, but I think it's because I was so low. <laughs> I've come a long way, but I still, it, it's just really nice to hang out and talk about these things because these are the things that no one ever talks about. Yeah. Everyone think, a lot of people think all these topics are stupid and it's like, man, but when you talk about it and, and you, you share and you learn, this is how we transform ourselves, you know? This is it. Yeah. Very powerful. So, all right, ascensionworks.tv. And I think my Mystic Show website is still up, uh, but it's, I have to redo the website, I think. But anyway, the Mystic Show, you could subscribe. I don't put out that many episodes these days, but I, I probably will do more. And by the way, I have a, the back catalog of the Mystic Show is great. You can go back to episode one. I cover, it, it's, it's pretty cool. If you're into all this stuff, you might want to check it out. It's pretty cool. Yep. And you've been my guest before, too. Yep. A couple times. Um, just stay tuned for a lot more awesome stuff from both of us. Yeah, and please give us your feedback. If you need help, ask us for help. We're here. All right, we'll end it there. Thank you, Mike Waskowski from ascensionworks.tv. Go there, get your account set up. I got my account there. I got my username. <laughs> All right, we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Take care. Bye.